everyone. It is so good to be with you. Uh, again, if you're just walking in or you're just logging on, my name is Joe, one of the pastors here. Thanks for being with us. And over at Montrose, good to see you guys. Uh, glad to be here, but miss you as well. If, uh, if you don't know, most Sunday mornings, I'm over at Montrose uh, over there. And so uh, that's one of the reasons I always warmly greet them. They're my people. Uh, and so I uh, love doing that. Bath Campus has two locations here at Gent and over there at Montrose. And we love uh, sharing all those ministries the same. We've been uh, just starting a series called Sacrilege. And that's a word that like, I just like the word. Like, I don't know. I'm just being honest. Like, it's one of those ones. You ever hear a word? It just sounds right to you, you know? But every time I hear it in my head, I want to say it with an accent. It's like sacrilege. Like, I don't know why, but that's how I hear it every time in my head. And I have to make a conscious effort to say it like a normal person uh, when I say it out loud. So that's the series that we're in is sacrilege. Uh, And really what we're talking about is this idea of like, how on earth is it okay to do those things and kind of calling people out on that. So for instance, Super Bowl, it's happening, right? Don't think, just answer, who do you want to win? Cincinnati. And doesn't that feel sacrilegious? If you said Cincinnati, you're like, why am I okay with that? Like if you're a Browns fan, you're like, the rest of the year, you're like, those Bengals. And all of a sudden we're like, win it all. You know, like, Who are we? That's so sacrilegious, right? Other examples might be like, if you put the toilet paper back on the thing and you let it roll out from underneath, what kind of person are you, right? Like, oh, that is so sacrilegious. Or the end all, beat all. Pineapple on pizza, are you serious? Are you serious? Every percentage of my body that is Italian is like, ooh, like, no, you cannot do that. You cannot marry those two things together. I love pineapple. I love me some pizza. Mm -mm. Like, you do not put those things together. And if you disagree, you're wrong. Okay, so... um, Last week, Pastor Jeff walked us through this passage where Jesus uh, actually flipped tables, right? Something was going on so intense that got him uh, under his skin so much that he purposefully flipped tables. People were getting in the way of of people's pursuit of God, and Jesus was clearing the way by flipping those tables. If you know of that passage or you're curious what that's like and you weren't here last weekend, uh, catch up on that, right? Podcast app, website, like go back, listen to that. You're like, I don't have time. Have you ever heard of double speed? It's a wonderful, glorious thing when you're trying to catch up. I love it. You talk like this a little bit, but it's okay. You catch up to it in about 30 seconds and you're at least able to uh, download a little bit of that conversation, but it was so good, so helpful. Check that out. Today, we're going to get into a different concept, right? Because the whole idea really of what we're trying to unpack with sacrilege is that it's when religion gets in the way of God, right? And so if you're in earshot of this, if you're in the room, if you're watching online, like something in you says, I want to be closer to God. Um, If you know him, you wanna be closer. If you don't know him, you're like, what would it be like to know him? How can I know God? But throughout history, kind of over and over again, sometimes people make things messy and all of a sudden the stuff that was meant to help us see God gets in the way and actually separates us a little bit from the heart of God. And that is sacrilege, right? Like what are these things? And so some religious leaders, they were doing that last week when Jeff talked about flipping the tables at the temple. And then this weekend, we're gonna talk about this idea of the Sabbath, another instance where Jesus was, in terms of the religious leaders, were kind of being, he was being sacrilegious. And so if you have a Bible with you, I wanna encourage you to open up to Mark chapter two. Uh, We've been kind of walking through the beginning stages of Jesus' ministry now for months, actually, not just in this series. But as we kind of look at what were the things that Jesus was doing? What was he saying? What were, in some ways, what were the fights that he was willing to pick, that he elevated to say, this is a place of clarity that I want to make sure that we understand. So we're going to kind of walk over this story that is Mark uh, 2, starting in verse 23, it goes through 28, and uh, we're not going to get into it tonight, but the concept of him addressing the Sabbath even continues in the chapter 3, so maybe later this week you can dive into more of that, Uh, but let's, let's go ahead and dive in. So Jesus... One Sabbath day, Jesus was walking through some grain fields and his disciples began breaking off heads of grain to eat. 
But the Pharisees or the teachers of the law said to Jesus, look, why are they breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? Let's pause for a second. The Sabbath was this day of rest. And we'll unpack that here a little bit more. But the idea was that you weren't supposed to do anything on the Sabbath. No work, no effort, no nothing, right? So even in the case of the eyes of the Pharisees, picking a grain head, right? was like, whoa, 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 why are you working? And that's what they're questioning Jesus for. And specifically, Jesus, why are you letting the people that follow you, you say you're about God, why are you letting them do this thing that God said you're not allowed to do? That's the heartbeat of what's happening here. But Jesus answers in 27, 28, he says, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. So, The son of man is Lord and even over the Sabbath. What he's saying is this whole concept of the Sabbath is supposed to be something that benefits people. It's not meant to be something that is now in front of people, just another hoop to jump through to please God. And oh, by the way, I'm not just guessing at that. Oh, by the way, I'm not just saying that's my opinion. Jesus is also saying, I'm the Lord over the Sabbath. I literally know that's what this is about. Okay, I was there when this was initiated. This was a part of our intention as God. This is what the Sabbath is for. So what are we gonna unpack? I wanna show you a couple of things because we're gonna find ourselves in this story in a few different ways. First of all, I wanna just kind of clarify that God created this, right? This was something very intentional, very on purpose by God that the Sabbath is something that he had in mind and has intended for people. So what was he thinking? when he instituted that. The second thing is, is religion messed it up, right? Now, not all religious activity is obviously bad, but sometimes, as I mentioned before, when people start to kind of mix themselves into all this stuff, they add in these layers, they add in these hoops, and all of a sudden, we're focused so much on those hoops that we're missing the point, right? We're gonna see kind of how that plays out. And then, we're gonna see how Jesus calls us back to its roots. What is this really about? And specifically showing us again, this is really important. Okay, this idea of Sabbath is very important. It's not something we should just gloss over. It's not something that we should just kind of put to the side and say, oh, that's an old rule. Now, here's the thing. In the Jewish culture then, and even today, The Sabbath was everywhere. Now let's talk about that Jewish culture historically for a second. Everyone knew what the Sabbath was. This wasn't like, hey, what are you talking about? What was that S word? Like, I didn't hear the thing. What are you referring to? Like, this was the thing. Like, and so Sabbath in ancient Jewish culture, it started at sundown on Friday and it went all the way through sundown on Saturday, which is kind of ironic if you think about it because we think about like, oh, we go to church on the Sabbath. If you attend Grace Church in the winter, we don't offer services on the Sabbath, okay? Like, none of them happen before it gets dark on Saturday, which is kind of ironic, but that's where we are, right? But that's kind of how we think. And that's how it was in Jewish culture. Everyone did Sabbath and you were in trouble if you didn't, which is why the Pharisees were asking that question of Jesus. Okay, now fast forward. A lot of the things that we're used to about the weekends have its roots all the way back to the Sabbath. The fact that we even have a weekend, like slow down, enjoy the weekend, is like actually partially connected to the ideas of the Sabbath. The fact that so many businesses used to all be closed on Sunday, the whole concept of that was Sabbath, Chick-fil-A. Okay, like they're so, they're, they're locked into that idea. They want to give their employees rest. That whole concept, locking back into the intentionality of what the Sabbath is. If you have any type of family tradition where like the family gets together, whether it be on Saturday or Sunday, we get together and have dinner. That idea, that natural inclination is rooted back to the Sabbath. There's tons of things in our culture that find its beginnings there, whether we realize it or not. And it's that understanding, but even more, that these Jewish leaders and Jesus and his disciples would have been living in and trying to understand how do we navigate this now that we're kind of looking at Jesus and he's helping us see something a little bit better. Now, as I was kind of studying all this, I wanted to kind of look back to, so what is it that God was trying to institute? And I stumbled across uh, these two Hebrew words, right? So Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures were all written in Hebrew. And these two words really brought a depth of meaning that I didn't expect 
expect. Because I just thought Sabbath meant, you know, the churchy day that you don't do anything. Like, that's kind of what I thought it was. But as I looked at these two words, I started to realize that God might have intended something a little bit deeper and richer than maybe we fully understand. So the first one is Shabbat, okay? This is the Jewish understanding of clocking out. So if you've ever had a job or if you have a job where you like do a time card and you're like, I am done. You can no longer tell me to do anything. I am done. I am clocked out. I am out of your control. Like I am not doing any more work. I'm clocking out. It's that whole mindset, right? You are kind of like, washing your hands of being busy and you're saying, I am done. I'm gonna stop working. And so that is what Shabbat is. The second word is nuach, okay? And there is a little bit of phlegm at the end of that. So, uh, but nuach is this idea of settling in. Okay, it's settling in. So picture yourself with a friend, like kind of like huddling up near a bonfire, right? Like you're like, we're just gonna get a little bit closer. We're just kind of locking into the solemnity of the moment, the peacefulness of this. We're gonna listen to the fire crackle. We're gonna enjoy each other, right? Or maybe it's even like I'm going to grandma's for the weekend and on a Friday night, you're kind of unpacking your suitcase or your overnight bag. because like, I'm gonna be here for a while. This isn't a quick visit. This isn't like a, what time is it? I gotta get out of here. Like I'm settling in to be here in the moment, okay? And so this idea of Sabbath is both of these things combined, okay? It's both of these things combined. It's not just stopping. It's not even just let's have some meaningful time together. It's let's stop and have some meaningful time together. How can we marry these things together? Now, Sabbath was instituted all the way back at the very beginning, Genesis chapter two, right? God had just created the heavens and the earth and the animals and the fish and the birds and the people and all the things, right? Six days, everything is created. And then by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work. And then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. This is fascinating. You'll see both concepts here. God finished the work he had done. He didn't create extra things on the seventh day. He didn't say, oh yeah, eventually thousands of years from now, they're gonna want that internet thing. So I'm gonna put those particles in the air that make that possible on the seventh day. Like that was not the seventh day. The seventh day, he finished and stopped his work, right? Like he didn't do a little bit of extra. He didn't do a little bit of tweak. He's like, what about birthmarks? People will love those. And like, he didn't do extra things on the seventh day. He stopped. But then like the verse could have been done there. He finished his work. No. And then he blessed that day and he made it holy, special, set apart for something different right? That day is meant to be something other, not just a repeat of the six days prior, not just the same mentality we've been doing as we work all week, but something unique is supposed to take place on this day. God, from the very beginning, made it holy, again, special and set apart. And so as I was trying to think through what is the mentality then of the Sabbath, even when we see it again in the 10 Commandments, right? He's trying to throw this thing out today, like we should do this. I wonder, I mean, just think with me, dream with me for a moment. What if we had time every week that we would purposefully slow down. Let's set aside all the stuff that is stressing us out, that's making us anxious, that we're worried about. Let's settle in with God. Let's settle in with those that are closest to us. Let's actually recharge and reconnect then we'll do it again next week. Like what if, what if God was trying to help us, but then things started to get twisted and we started to mess it up because we initially, I think as human beings, we saw the value in it. And then we, we like started to say, well, now it's a rule. Well, now you have to do this. And we shifted from, well, what if, to you better. And we shifted from, wouldn't this be awesome, to you're messing up if you're not doing anything like this. And we brought an intensity and a fire to it. 
And what was supposed to be God loving us and his faithfulness, his faithfulness to us and trying to help us live life to the fullest became something that we were scolded for. Imagine, imagine being tired and then being scolded for it. How dare you be sleepy right now? I can't believe you're even thinking about taking a nap after a long week. I can't get, you've been wired all night? You can't sleep? Well, you're messing up. It's like, we, we don't talk that way to each other when it comes to sleep because we all understand there's actually nothing there to scold. We're not like, I, I'm, I'm ridiculously sensitive to caffeine. Like if I have a, a caf, like if I have a cup of iced tea, like after 8 p.m., I'm wired to like 4 a.m. Like I can't have much caffeine. I just get my motor running. Like I did it a couple of nights ago and I was laying in bed. Um, actually, it was one of those bubblies, like, you know, kind of like a LaCroix, those drinks that have a hint of hint of flavor. You know, where uh, it's like, you know, what flavor is that LaCroix? It's like, I passed by a lime truck. That's what flavor this is. You know, like there's no actual flavor. Well, I had one of those because, you know, it's healthy. Uh, And so I had one of those and I didn't realize it had caffeine in it. And it was like 930 at night, you know, and then like I actually fell asleep fine. And all of a sudden at two o'clock, I was like, well, uh, here we go. And like, I happened to look at my watch and I'm like, my pulse is like 80 at 2 a.m. after sleeping fantastic. You know, I'm just like, oh, wow. And I could do this and I could do this. I'm just like going, right? Like I'm, I'm wired with caffeine. Now imagine someone scolding me for that. (laughs) I can't believe that you let caffeine bother you and you didn't get the rest that you need. I mean, it'd be ridiculous. What do we do when we discover someone can't rest or sleep well? We try to help them. Have you tried fuzzy socks? Like, man, you pull that fuzzy goodness right over your feet and all of a sudden you're just encapsulated in a little bag of warmness on each little tootsie and you're like ready to go, you know? Or these sheets, these sheets are the sheets. Like you gotta have these sheets because if you don't have these sheets, you don't know what you're doing with sheets, you gotta have the sheets and it's all about thread count, right? It's all about thread count. You have a 200 thread count, we gotta up that bad boy, right? Like we gotta have the sheets because if you don't have the sheets, how can you sleep, right? Or like, have you tried essential oils? Because if you put a little bit of lavender and a little diffuser, like, oh my goodness. I'm like, are we switching religions? Like, I'm not really sure what's going on here right now, right? But we try to help each other, right? We try to offer solutions. Oh, if you're not resting, I've been there or I can rest well. Let me show you some of the, we try to help each other. We're in in rhythms of not resting well. And God knows that too. He's not scolding us that we better observe the Sabbath. He's trying to say, I know you need rest. Let me show you something. I wanna pause here for a minute because if we're not careful, we can find ourselves in versions of that scolding mindset. Maybe it's not with the Sabbath, but maybe it's with something else that we've discovered or we've seen or we've always done this thing that we feel like we should be doing for God, that we feel like helps us maybe even connect with God. And then when people don't do the thing or don't pursue God the way that we think they should be doing it, we do start nitpicking grain heads a little bit. We're like, well, you know, you should be reading your Bible. If you're not up at 4 a.m., if you're not doing this, if you're not at church every week, you know, if you're not reading that version of the Bible, you know, if you're not doing this, you know, if you're not listening to that podcast or even trying to follow Jesus, you know, if you don't do this, you know, I can't believe, and we'll slip right in to all of these strong opinions, maybe even way back when it was out of the best motives. And then suddenly we're scolding other people for not doing things the way that we do them. Music, for instance, is always a good example. Like, some, like <laughs> one of my favorite things about Pastor Jeff, our offices have a wall between them, and don't let that fool you. Uh, it's thin. And so when he turns on his music to, like, dial in, you know, and get ready to preach and stuff like that, like, I get a little bit of Southern Gospel <laughs> concert, you know, right there in my office. It's fantastic. Uh, 
And he would playfully tell you, that's like the Lord's music. Like it just helps him settle in. And others of you, you're like, I need some classical slow down focus if I wanna focus and pray. Some of you are like, I need some like upbeat worship. Some of you are like, let's mellow that sucker down. A little bit of acoustic guitar is all I need. And then if we're not careful, we can start to share those opinions in a way that like, how dare you have these opinions about that kind of music? These are the only way, like all I'm saying is, it might be easier than we think to slip into that mindset of I'm starting to nitpick how other people are trying to follow Jesus. And I wanna make sure that we're like slowing that train down because God is not arbitrarily setting up boundaries in our life so that we have to stay within them. God is showing us where the edge of the cliff is. He's like, hey, Let's slow down, let's rest, because if you don't, a lot of these things that you say you value, that we say are important to us, we're gonna miss the train, we're gonna miss the boat, and these things are not gonna happen the way that you think they are. And boy, I started to really wrestle with that this week. I'm like, well, where do I find myself in that conversation? Because if Jesus is right in saying that the, uh, the Sabbath is to meet the needs of people, if the Sabbath is something that I would benefit from, well, how do I envision navigating it? Because if I'm being totally honest, I'm not super awesome at Sabbath. So this is not me saying like, I have figured it out and you need to get you know, on your saddle and figure out how to do Sabbath too. My invitation is, will you join me in rediscovering what it means to Sabbath and specifically to Shabbat and to Nuach to stop and settle in, to figure out how can I actually cease the things that are wiring me, that are keeping me so busy and just go, 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 but also to like stop and connect with God, connect with the people in my life that I miss so much. And so I I broke it down into two different ways. I'm just asking myself, I wonder if you'll ask yourself, why do we fight against Shabbat? Why do we fight against stopping? We're busy. We could probably do an example of this in the lobby or online after the service. And I could ask you, how you doing? And if we talked for about 30 seconds, almost to the person We're going to say, blah, 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 and I'm really busy. I have so much going on. I'm stressed out right now. I'm overwhelmed. Things at work are crazy right now. I'm running around like a chicken with my head cut off, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We are all so busy. And even if you're one of the few, you're like, I actually don't feel that busy right now. You still know what I'm talking about because you talk to other people. We're so busy. And like even right now, like I'm so wired to do this myself, right? I I am so prone to this. Like I was just thinking about that today. I'm like coaching game day, kindergarten and first grade girls. (laughs) Woo, okay. Like this is, I am not called to that age group, okay? Like that is not my thing. Shout out running mermaids though, because they're my peeps. Like I... I'm having fun with it and whatever, but it is a thing, right? To show up at practice and show up at the game and to work with the kids and do all this and it adds to the busyness. And we all got those things, right? And, and, and lots of the things that we're doing are worth it and they're good. And I might even encourage you, you should do those things, but we don't stop. We often don't know where to say no. We don't know where the limits are, where the boundaries should be. And to the extent that we're like Sabbath, we'll subconsciously say that must be an Old Testament thing because there's no way that I could fully stop all the stuff I got going on. My to-do list is literally like 587 things long. At this point, it's not a to-do list. It's a catch-all for ideas that I think I might be able to get to one day. Ha, 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 yeah, right. Like that's what my to-do list actually is. And every day that goes by, not only do I have 587 things to do, but if I don't get them all done, the stress of not getting them done weighs on me. 
And so it's this constant back and forth of I'm so busy and I got all this stuff going on and I'm trying to juggle it all. And even if I try to stop for a moment, I'm like, well, I got to think through and plan through and work all this stuff out because if I don't get any of that done, I'm a failure and all these kind of things that might flood through our brain and we're just busy. Why do we fight it? What is it about knowing that we're so busy and yet we still fight against something like Shabbat? Why do we do that? So I'm wrestling with that. But then there's the other side of it. Why do we fight against Nuach? Why do we fight against settling in and connection and being with God or being with people. Some of us, we like just shy of worship, the stopping kind of rest. We like live for the weekend. We're like Friday, I'm out. Like Friday's like the best day because I know it's gonna end and then I have the weekend in front of me and we're always looking at how can I slow down and I'm gonna binge watch that show and I got that thing coming up and I'm just gonna relax and I'm gonna play video games for five hours or maybe that's not even enough time and I gotta catch up on this and I got Boba Fett because Boba Fett was, I gotta watch Boba Fett and I gotta catch up on this and I got so much to do and we're like, how can I check out? We're actually not half bad at Shabbat. We're like ready to stop. But why do we fight against the things that are gonna help us connect? Why is it that I'm prone to want to detach when I want rest. I have this thing every once in a while where I'll get some time, I'll pick my daughter up from school and it's my day off too. And so like I'll get home and I'm like, everything in me is like, go play a game and leave me alone. Now here's the irony. I don't know that there's another person on this planet that I'd rather spend time with. So what is that? What is that inside of us that says, I wanna pull away from the people I love? I don't think it's the Lord. I think it's some version of fighting against new walk, avoidance of connection. Because ironically, we'll do all of these things and we'll miss the connection. Many of you are familiar with that phrase that we buy the things that we don't have money for to impress the people that we don't like. And I would probably add all while ignoring the people that we say we're doing it for. Honey, I'm gonna be in the garage tinkering on this thing because you know it'll be good for us. I'm gonna clean the garage. I mean, it might need done. I need to clean my garage. But like, what is it about, you, you guys stay there. I'll, I'll be over here. What is that? And I'm not saying we never need time in in solitude. I'm not even saying that, but what is it about the Saturday night, the Sunday morning and going, well, I could just spend the time going to the golf course. I could just spend the time finally catching up on that Netflix series. I could just, because I need rest. And I I, I need me time. And we avoid the connection. Isn't it true I think for all of us that we wish we were closer to the people that we love. I mean, I can't think of a person that I know personally that I wish I spent less time with. I mean, I'm like looking around at like the faces in this room and like some of us know each other pretty well and I would love to hang out more. I mean, I I want to be with people. I wish I could spend more time with my dad. I wish I could spend more time with my brothers, my sister. I wish I could spend more time with my in-laws, believe it or not. I wish I could spend more time with old friends from school. I wish I could be the person that walks up the road and visits a neighbor more often. I wish I could spend more time with my best friends. I wish I could spend more time with God. I wish I could spend more meaningful time with him. I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish. And yet, when it comes to rest, I tend to fight against new walk and I isolate myself from all the people that I love Or even when sometimes I connect with them, I still do things that aren't connection. They're just fluff. And then we don't have 
that depth? When do we settle in? When do we connect? When do we get to know each other more? And it can be over the fun things. It can be go-karting. It can be a round of golf. It can be video games, but connect. It could be binge watching TV. I'm, I'm re-watching the show The Chosen right now. And I like just feel my heart get pulled closer and closer into the Lord. And I'm watching TV. It doesn't necessarily matter what the activity is, but are we connecting? Are we settling in? Is Nuach a part of our rest? Now, a couple of weeks ago, I was uh, watching the show This Is Us. You guys know how hard it can be to find a show that you actually want to watch with a friend or a spouse or a boyfriend or girlfriend. This isn't it. Uh, but <laughs> it is a show that my wife and I will watch together. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, it just hit me dead in the eyes. Wasn't expecting it. That show's always trying to be emotional anyway. And there's probably a whole lot of sermons and teachings that we could do based off of that show. But this moment, if you don't know, um, about 10, uh, actually about 11 months ago now, my mother passed away. And uh, I was watching this show and all of a sudden it just hit me. I don't have a mom anymore. And um, it, that is complicated in a lot of ways, but uh, just that overarching umbrella, emotion, thought, reality, like just hit me like a wave that like, I don't, if there was any reconciliation that needed to happen, well, she's not here right now to do that with. If I wanted to text her, if I wanted to call her up, if I wanted to see if today was gonna be a good day, I don't have that option. I, I find myself certainly not wishing that I had less time with her I, I, I like long for better connection, for more. That maybe we could rebuild some of the things. I think you guys get it. We're so busy. And I don't think we're gonna get to the end of our life wishing we were more disconnected from people. I don't think we're gonna show up in heaven telling God, I'm really glad we've been distant. We want the connection. So what is it inside of us that continues to fight against it? I think the Sabbath is this Reminder, this encouragement that we should stop and that we should settle in because what if every week we could slow down and put the stuff that stresses us to the side? It'll be there tomorrow. And settle in with the God who loves us that we wish we were closer to and settle in with the people that we love and that we wish we were closer to. And what if we just did that give or take once a week. What if God was inviting us to something that was special? You know, and as I got to thinking about that and I started to realize I'm pretty sure that's what a lot of the things that might be heavy on our heart are for. I don't know about you, but I don't go to church regularly because I'm supposed to. I don't go to church regularly because it's some kind of rule. And from my vantage point, I don't even go to church regularly because I'm a pastor. I go to church regularly because I need the focus. I need the moments to slow down and put my eyes on what counts and to reflect on lyrics and sing my heart out and pray 
and be reminded of what is great and good and life-giving and awesome in the life of Christ. And I need people that will high five and fist bump and hug and share and laugh and cry when I'm trying to figure out how to follow Jesus. I need it. So when I hear things like go to church regularly, I'm not like, how dare you establish another rule for me? I'm like, thank you for the reminder. I'm not a part of my life group because I'm supposed to be in a group. I'm in my life group because I don't know what I would do if I couldn't hash out all the junk that flies through my mind on a weekly basis and that I could process what's happening in this ridiculously chaotic world with people that know me, that love me, that I know and I love, and that we can actually figure out how to take one step at a time in life. I'm not going to group because I have to. I'm going to group because I need it. I'm not reading the Bible because, you know, healthy disciplines say you should be in the Bible every day. I'm reading the Bible because the more that I allow myself to soak in the heart of God the more it presses out all of the junk that every other voice in our culture is consistently trying to fill in my head and it gives me some clarity that I can trust God and his faithfulness. It's not, you better read. It's, oh my gosh, man, I need the refreshment of God's heartbeat in his word. You see, Jesus doesn't build walls between us and God. He creates pathways to him. Jesus isn't trying to give you more rules. He's not trying to make sure that you have more hoops to jump through. He's not trying to make sure that your religion is right. He's trying to say, how about I do everything I can, by the way, even die for you, so that you can have a pathway to connect with God to stop and settle in and begin to feel the warmth and the life that is available when he's at the top. Some of us, we might be having a hard time still with this God thing. And we've been wondering all along, we hear messages or we hear people talk about, and I had this question about this verse I heard about one time, and and we're still not sure if Jesus is for us. Jesus is inviting us to a fulfilled life, to a place where our soul can finally be put at ease, no matter the ups or the downs that we're walking through, that we can rest in him and find a place where people can help begin to meet the needs that are at the depth of our hearts. This is the gospel, that we find ourselves in need and that Jesus would reach out his hand and say, come to me. And he begins to take away the sin and the effort and the hustle and bustle of life that is just exhausting. And he says, I can expel that darkness. I will forgive your sin. You don't need to worry. You don't need to stress anymore. Come and trust and lean into me. Let me stop the madness that's going on in here and show you that you can rest and trust in me. Later on in his ministry, Jesus says exactly that. He says, come to me. You're weary, you're burdened, you're stressed. Life is overwhelming. Come to me and I will give you rest. You take my yoke upon you, you learn from me, I'm gentle, I'm humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. Let's jump on to that pathway that Jesus is creating. Let's find ourselves willing 
to step out and say, I need the rest. And not just detachment rest, but connected rest. Where I would rediscover the heart of my father, my savior. And if you've been following Jesus, Some of us, as I've had certain conversations, I hear things like, well, when I gave my life to Christ and I don't understand why I don't always experience the peace that he has. But we miss the invitations and we miss the pathways. I, I, I don't wanna pretend anymore that like somehow I don't need to reconnect and recharge with Jesus just because I've already given my life to him. I don't want to pretend anymore like I'm immune to needing rest. I'm not the hero of the story. Jesus is. And so can we admit to each other that like we're allowed to stop? Can we admit to each other that we need to connect and can we allow ourselves to start putting those rhythms into our life so that we can experience the slow but sure flood of his grace and mercy and peace as it starts to show up in our life? Guys, I wanna, I wanna make the Sabbath a real part of my rhythms. I wanna discover and rediscover and rediscover and rediscover what it's like to unpack my suitcase and settle in by the fire with Jesus and those that I love the most. Maybe this is a moment where we can do a little bit of that right now. The band's gonna come out, they'll adjust some things on stage, but what they're doing right now is they're getting the bonfire ready. They're letting us unpack the suitcase for a second. And they're gonna create a pathway for us to respond in prayer or singing or silence or something, but to look to our God and say something to the effect of Jesus, I think I get it. I want more of you and show me what it means to stop and connect. Will you pray with me? Father God, I needed this wake up call. I needed you to slow me down <laughs> and remind me of what it means to be connected to you. And Father, I'm probably gonna need it about 52 times a year because it's easy to get busy and it's easy to be in the hustle and bustle and it's easy to forget that the slowing down and the connecting with you it's kind of what we're on this earth to do in the first place. And so help us, whether we've never done that before, help us have the boldness to reach out and say, how do I start doing this? And if we've done it before, help us to have the humility to go right back to it. But Father, I know that your hands are open. I know that you're welcoming us home and that the rest, the true, connected, recharged rest is available lead us to you. Help us to connect with you, Father, and it's your name we pray. Amen.